Marriage Champions, I'm Amy Morgan, the feature writer for the San Antonio Marriage Initiative. Today, I'm delighted to introduce you to Dr. Mark Regneris, a professor of sociology at the University of Texas in Austin and a senior fellow at the Austin Institute for the Study of Family and Culture. Mark's written four books and more than 40 articles and book chapters published in outlets as varied as Christianity Today, The National Review, and The Wall Street Journal. His research focuses on sexual behavior, family, marriage, and religion. Mark, thank you so much for being here. Happy to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Oh, well, we are delighted. You have conducted research all around the world about views and trends toward marriage. In fact, you just came back from a trip. Uh, the Future of Christian Marriage, your book, addressed some of that, but what's the word on the street out there now? Uh, if you could characterize the word on the street among young adults around the world, it's one of uh, kind of chronic uncertainty, basically. Chronic uncertainty. There's just a, there is an angst about um, the norms and patterns and pathway that leads towards marriage. Uh, Christians around the world still value marriage. They want to marry. And yet the kind of the, the, the pathway to getting there is no longer sort of uh, as clear as it once was. And that, that's the case whether we're talking about United States, here in Texas, San Antonio, Austin, or um, countries as varied as um, Russia, Poland, Nigeria, Lebanon, Spain, Mexico. It, it is, I said in, in, the, in the book, that it's almost as if there's this spirit that's traveling the world, kind of creating this sort of endemic uncertainty um, all over the place. It's, uh, it's discouraging to some extent. At the same time, it's encouraging to know that people around the world still want to get married, but there are just barriers, mostly of their own kind of mental making uh, that is preventing them from moving forward or moving forward quickly uh, in ways that we're, a lot of us were more familiar with 20, 30 plus years ago. Can we talk about that? Because, I mean, I know any of us who has contact with young adults, you know, I have two young adult sons, I've got nephews that are in their 20s, and you see that, even, even here in the Bible Belt, you don't see this, this hurry, even, be, even couples that have been dating for, you know, what you would think would have been long enough back when, you know, the dinosaurs roamed the earth, like when I was in school. <laughs> right. What is their ambivalence? What are they waiting for? Uh, it's it's a mixture of things. It's kind of part of it is sort of this economic sense, right? So, by the way, I mean, I, I did this data collection prior to the COVID era and prior to sort of our, our central Texas explosion in housing prices, which didn't help this at all. Uh, but even before that, there was this, uh, there's this kind of low grade economic angst that, uh, I can't make it, but part of that is, uh, rooted in this sort of psychological sense that, uh, any kind of short-term poverty must be avoided. And I think that is a, a change and a shift from 20, 30 plus years ago, where a lot of couples marrying in their early twenties, sometimes even before that kind of ac accepted or understood that there was, you know, things were going to be tight and lean for a while until the two of them together could, could, could build something. There is somewhat of a disinterest in that uh, building that thing together today. Today, there's this mentality that I become marriageable by first building something by myself. And then kind of looking around to see who's out there, who's impressed with what I've done. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's about the idea of marriageability, which has grown more complicated uh, over the last few decades. Marriageability used to be kind of straightforward, and now it's a lot more, uh, there's a lot more criteria to it, both for him and for her. And mm -hmm. so you ask men, like, what is it that would make you marriageable? Uh, if you asked me that back in college, you know, when I was courting my wife, um, I would have said, you know, prospects, right? You know, like you know, yeah, yeah. A, a future. Yeah. And now it's like, 
prospects is not enough. Like men feel like they have to have produced these things already. Uh, so that uh, they think marriage is something that can, they can accomplish perhaps by maybe mid twenties, but more likely the later twenties or even early thirties. So people think about marriage ability in, 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 a, in a different set of ways than they used to. Some of that's stimulated or augmented by our kind of penchant for online life. Mm -hmm. I know, you know, around the world in economies that are not nearly as uh, fertile as ours, there is still this, this sense of having to earn something first before becoming marriageable, partly because, you know, we can talk about the globalization of, of uh, 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 you know, the United States and its visions that as travels the entire world because people there now easily see what we do here, see yeah. our television, etc. And the idea of marriage as something that is postponed until your mid to late 20s or 30s is now common mm -hmm. everywhere, such that uh, it's probably easier and earlier to marry here than in most of those countries I listed earlier. You talked about the men feeling like they had to not just have prospects, but have results to be yeah. marriageable. What about the, what about the girls? What are, what are their pressures? Right. So they now too sort of feel like, okay, I need to go to college. I need to start a career. I can't bank on the man. I can't plan on that. I hope it happens, but uh, they too are sort of building a life as if marriage may or may not happen. And you know, the ironic thing is uh, for fewer and fewer women, it is happening. Uh, probably about 30 years ago, 90% of, of women married at some point in their adult life. Today, the latest demographic projections are about two thirds of women will marry. So 90 down to about 65%, which is a rather, dramatic drop in only a couple, uh, two, three decades. So they too anticipate uh, troubles. At the same time, you know, their standards in marriageability of men have risen in partly because they don't not need to marry anymore to be culturally, economically successful. So uh, whereas maybe a hundred years ago, a, a sort of benchmark, um, I like him, he treats me well, he can hold down a job. Um, He's it. <laughs> it wasn't much more than that, right? And now there's a, a lots of there's ideological kind of uh, conditions. Uh, the conditions of like, uh, you know, what he looks like are, you know, it's not that that has was never important, but that's become a little bit more important. Um, but also sort of. The, the, the personality fit has got to be there. So the criteria have grown, I'd say for both men and for women, or perhaps more for women than for men, because they don't really need marriage. And I think we underestimate how much this has changed the terrain here. Uh, the, the fact that people are entering the adult world, frankly, you know, with a recognition that they don't need to do this. And that don't need to do this increases the number of people out there who are marriage skeptics. They may still marry, but they certainly don't enter that sort of sweet spot of marriage, you know, the mid to later 20s, thinking that uh, they really want to do that. What about like the sleeper effect of their parents' divorces? We've got a lot of people in that generation that have seen their parents go through that. How does that affect their ability right. to commit? Yeah, that uh, that is something, you know, that they can do things about, you know, their own attitudes about marriage, uh, their criteria, all that stuff. What they can't do anything about is the damage that's already been done to them by uh, growing up in a household that's split. I know from the National Study of Family Growth, a very good data set that um, even from year one of your marriage, if your parents are divorced, your own risk of splitting is uh, statistically distinctively higher than it is for someone who, who couple who's marrying whose parents did not divorce. So that's, I, I call that in the book, 
the gift that keeps on taking from us, um, the legacy of divorce. So it's not, it's not that, that, that young people don't recognize that it matters. Um, it's just that it, there are subtle ways in which it matters. And I talk about in the book how, um, you know, the, my first year of being married was somewhat difficult. I mean, I, I don't think we got a honeymoon effect. Uh, things improved over time. But I remember thinking that uh, no, nobody in my family, immediate family, had any experience of divorce. And I liked my in-laws. <laughs> and I would hate to disappoint them and certainly disappoint my parents. And so these things were kind of enough to keep me in the game until, and, and committed to working on it until things improved. So fundamentally, I did not have a narrative, a story a, uh, to follow of how to, how to leave my wife. Yeah. So I think a lot of people do have that story and mull that over when difficulty comes as it always does to people. So the legacy of divorce is a tough one. Um, another aspect of that legacy is parents who split now they, they sort of, they're, when they look at their children growing up in their early mid twenties, their advice to their children is different than it would be if they hadn't split. Yeah. Their advice now is, okay, you have got to sort of form an independent life. Yeah. Uh, you have to have a, a career, a job, you have to be able to afford it if this thing collapses. It's like, so they're speaking kind of from their own experience, but at the same time, like they're in, instilling in children a sort of a marriage skepticism from the get-go. And I think that is uh, not necessarily helpful. Yeah, you talked about that. And, and I, I that really struck me about how, about how that works. Um, I know that was one of the things. Another thing we talked about a little bit was that you found contrary as, as people are waiting and waiting longer in to get married in other countries around the world. In fact, most of them, those adult children are still part of the family life at home. Whereas yeah. in America, that's not normative at all for us. And it has, that oh. has some upsides and downsides. Yeah, it does. And we're just so used to it. And we think that it is kind of universally a good idea. I have come in the last decade to think that it is it is definitely not a universally good idea. And it might be a bad idea in some ways. We like to think, oh, they need to see their the experience independence um, in order to kind of document or prove their marriage ability, right? Yeah, Most of the rest of the world has never sort of felt like that. Uh, so children typically in other countries Adult children live in the household until they leave to marry. Not always, but quite often. And I've come to appreciate that for a handful of reasons. One of which is, you know, in the United States, we're talking about like emerging adulthood now. And I think uh, there, the wisdom then of, of booting out one's children at, say, 19, 20, 21, 22, when they often don't even perceive themselves as an adult is a sort of a, a dangerous idea psychologically and potentially morally. Mm -hmm. um, so our 22 year old finished college and uh, I, I, I wanted him to come home. You know, if he had gotten a job offer in some other place, fine, that's a different story, but he got a job offer in Austin. And I was like, no, you should live here. Right. Because um, <laughs> I don't think, you know, A, I, I'm a cheapskate and I don't want him to pay a thousand dollars plus rent to some, yeah. some stranger when the, you know, save your money and live here. But there's, there's all sorts of maturing that is still occurring. And the influence of parents, you think, oh, it ends at around 18. Pfft, not at all. Uh, the conversations we have had since he's moved back home and started his job here, I think are pretty influential on how he thinks about the future and how he thinks about marriage. I mean, he's in a serious relationship. He would like to get married. Um, so I just think that uh, this idea of demanding independence from young 20-somethings is uh, 
introduces more risk than we tend to realize. And then I you know, take a step back and you think, how does this American economy operate? I, it, it seems to like that we're built on the production of independence. More housing starts, more roads, more gasoline, more automobiles. Like we're just kind of built to, to separate. And part of that is a little disconcerting. And I think we need to push back as a Christian community, or at least not take it as for, for granted that the best option for a 22 year old is to be out. Yeah. Well, and I like that because you talked about that as a, as a community, what we can do. And I mean, you, and you said too, you said marriage is good and it's worthy and it's, and how can, how can we help that? I know that's some of the things you're talking about with, with what the Christians can do to foster a marriage friendly atmosphere. Right. So some of it's your own personal ability to, to talk about it. Like, so a couple of the suggestions I give in a later chapter in the book, there's eight kind of good suggestions about sort of helping to form and revivify a, sort of a marriage culture. One of those is the, own, the stories that you tell, right? Back to our, I, uh, the concept I just talked about, about divorced parents, like they have to kind of watch what they say about this, but they realize that they're telling stories about marriage and stories about marriage in general are extremely important. The ones that they get from mass media tend to be kind of uh, dismissive or sarcastic about marriage, thinking it's sort of um, A, unstable and B, un unexciting, I think are unhelpful. And the doofus dad, always the doofus yeah, dad. Right. Yeah. So I think we need to, to talk about marriage stories in our households not every day but sort of and, and they also need to witness your stable marriage right I, I know one of the things you know my wife and I you know, still bicker plenty but our children see that we solve problems uh, we reconcile insofar as it needs reconciliation but they know that they, it's there's a security to the place right and the security yes. to our marriage uh, that's helpful for them to to see because some kids, you know, their parents split and they didn't even see it coming, right? Which is crazy. Um, and that instills in them this sort of suspicion about like, I didn't know anything was wrong. Right. And now it collapsed. Going forward into adulthood, marriage is utterly unpredictable and unstable because you can think everything's fine and it's not. Yeah. I think that's, that's, <laughs> that's a bad story to tell and a bad story to exhibit. But we have to talk about marriage in general and talk about how to solve problems, et cetera. But that's the one-on-one the, the -on -one thing that we do. Besides that, I think uh, we need to think about sort of um, recovering marriage-friendly subcultures. Yeah. Now, I'm not making a pitch here for kind of uh, uh, young adult singles groups. I think those are clunky. I think those are artificial. Um, mm -hmm. I seldom hear really good things about them. Hmm. What we want to foster, I think, is uh, the idea of groups in which are comprised by people who believe in marriage, right? But for whom the kind of the point of getting together is not marriage per se. So one of the things we, I learned in the sort of gallivanting around several countries asking questions about these things yeah. is, the idea of, um, uh, especially in sort of Christian communities, you see vibrant marriage subcultures in these kind of groups of size, basically about 25 to 200, right? Mm -hmm. Parachurch organizations, um, things that are, that are smaller than the congregation, but larger than the small group, right? Small group, you know, is inherently unstable. If it's 10 or 12 people, do I want to ask her out? Crap, if she says no, you know, what am I going to do? Uh, somebody's going to have to leave the, the, the group or something. It's kind of ridiculous. But it, people don't want to ask stuff out, people out in small groups very well. But if it gets above 200 people, you have a hard time meeting people. So it's these groups that are not so vulnerable to um, collapse but not so large that they're anonymous. So <laughs> on college campuses, you think about intervarsity and things like that. Uh, okay, yeah, so say, give an example. Groups. Yeah, give an example yeah. of something a church, a kind of group that a church could could start that would kind of foster that. Right, right. Uh, I, I know in, in the Catholic community, we have something called theology on tap, where you know small 
smallish groups, 15, 20, 25 people, informally get together uh, over a beer and to have conversations about Christianity and theology. So there's that. Um, uh, InterVarsity works good if you're still in college. Yeah. Um, but church-based organizations that whose purpose is sort of either worship or learning or things like that, the purpose is not for singles to get together and talk. Yeah. Okay. It doesn't have to be exclusive to singles, right? Yeah. It's partly because, like, well, how, where are we going to meet people? Well, and partly you meet people not just by exposure to them in some group, but by secondhand uh, ad advice and people introducing you to people. Yes. And that, that married, married people can do that just fine, right? It's like, oh, I know my cousin. You should meet him, right? And so they make those kinds of connections. It's really just kind of, you know, it's not rocket science. It's getting back to the ways in which people used to meet instead of trusting an algorithm, which, you know, I understand you know, the, the significance and importance of those. But I, I do think we believe too much that computer algorithms know who we ought to meet when in fact your friends and family and church friends know better than an algorithm what you're looking for and who might be good for you, right? That's yeah. the kind of um, firsthand information that a computer can never deliver. Well, and that kind of, one of the things I was going to talk to you about was ways that churches can, you know, counter the, that kind of that that cheap sex revolution and the counterculture and and just like you're saying that one of those things is having physical ways you can meet people but maybe talk a little bit you you had mentioned in your your book cheap sex like three yeah. major changes in our culture that yeah. have been very detrimental to marriage which we all agree right. is good right and those are uh, they're social in nature so uh, it affects kind of how people think um the relationship market is and what it's like and what they can hope for so three things uh three technologies over the past 50 years have kind of what i call sunk the cost of sex meaning like um back in my grandparents era and uh, teen uh, 1920s um they didn't have to wrestle with either of these things right so prior to to 1960 ish uh the birth control pill didn't exist. And so sex was inherently risky, which meant people were more conservative in how they related to other people. And before they slept with someone, there had to be a good deal of relationship security, including engagement or marriage, right? Nowadays, uh, that's just not the case. People think of, uh, of uh, sex as sort of infertile by definition almost. Um, one famous scholar called it the contraceptive mentality, the understanding that relationships are by definition contraceptive, right? And so the risk of pregnancy disappears. And so it means the access to sex happens more quickly. So you have that, which we've been living with since uh, so wider uptake starting in the 70s. Um, you have the uptake of pornography, especially sort of high definition pornography and and you know uh, that kind of got its boost in the early 2000s um this sort of you know you hear women say oh i could never compete with this kind of person on screen and what they're t telling you is true because like they feel it as competition and what happens to competition it drives down prices so that women feel like they have to to act like this in order to get or keep a man, right? Which is, you know, disastrous in its consequences. And then third, even the kind of the advent and uptake of online dating uh, exacerbates this because people feel like persons are commodities. They swipe right, swipe left. I mean, it's like you're shopping, um, yeah, you're shopping. Uh, for a man, right? Or shopping for a woman. Like, well, this isn't how it's supposed to be, right? So you have this kind of situation where Three different technologies have kind of flooded the market, the mating market, the marriage market, uh, in such a way that it makes it more difficult for people to both connect meaningfully, secure a relationship, and confidently move forward. Instead, we're 
you know, part of our slowdown, our, our endemic uh, uncertainty is a function of exposure to options, right? When I met my wife in college, pre-internet era, you know, I, I knew of one girl maybe who was maybe interested in me. But <laughs> now you think about, uh, you know, dating now, it's like, you know, you can look and see who's interested in me, who's swiping right on me, who's uh, said they'd like to meet me. Like, it's probably not for me, but it's probably for a lot of young adults, a significant number of people. And so we play these games in our head, like, oh, maybe that could become something, right? It's really kind of typically a fiction, but it's a fiction that makes us uh, evaluate the current situation we're in more critically than uh, most of us did 20 plus years ago. Well, and you talk about that, about when you talk about evaluating a situation and then also looking for positive role models, you talked about, you know, I think that that expectation that your marriage is supposed to, supposed to be your soulmate and supposed to meet every single perceived need. Yeah. And that is really an unhealthy benchmark. Yeah, that's really a tall order. Good enough marriage is a much better. I'd love you to explain yeah. that because that's some place that, that I think our churches could really kind of bite in there. Right. I wrote an uh, an article in uh, First Things, the magazine, several years ago now, called "The Good Enough Good Enough Marriage." Uh, it's kind of a, this vision for. Um, I mean, I'd say most. If you, if you think about marital quality out there, um, it'll vary widely. Um, but people in their minds, especially starting out, expect and almost demand that their marriage be really, really good, right? Because, you know, we're saturated with high expectations. We don't need marriage. So if you don't need marriage, then to trade your independence, which yes. the longer you've been independent, the more you kind of value for uh, somebody else, like, well, this better be really good, right? And so we oh, anticipate hi. it being very good. Uh, but for some share of the population, and it's not small, marriage is decent, but you know, ah, maybe not what they exactly expected. But I, you know, I, I think marriage is a social good, and the, it's one of the what I call uh, and others, including all the way back, I think, to Aristotle, the three necessary societies: uh, marriage and family, and like for us to be so flippant about them and to, to be so demanding upon them. Uh, is 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 a poor idea personally and and socially, so I think we kind of got to recognize our uh, responsibility for helping other people around us appreciate their marriages, even if they're not you know as fabulous as they they want them to be, because there is such a thing as a good enough marriage, and the the idea of soulmate is uh, somewhat toxic. We need friendships. We need men need to be friends with other men women with other women, uh, because when those things happen within reason, um, we have put into context our marriage, our union as being supportive, bonding, helpful, but not all encompassing as in like uh, able to, to, to bear the load of everything. And I think that's a uh, that's an unrealistic expectation for marriage. Well, and you had also talked about the concept that there's an usness that's created. It's kind of a third entity, and it can't just be dissolved yeah. at the drop of the hat. There's yeah. there's something else there. It's not it, it really can't be dissolved ever. <laughs> we think about divorce as dissolving a marriage. Like if you think it actually uh, makes it as if it did not exist, I think that's unrealistic. I mean. First of all, you carry all sorts of emotions, et cetera, back into singlehood after it. If you have children, that union is truly never completely fractured because you have to deal with it throughout your adult life, such that some sociologists uh, think of our patterns of relationships in the United States as basically serial monogamy. Even if we have divorced one spouse and remarried another, like we are still you know, in relationship with that spouse not in a sexual relationship, but still in a, a relationship of parenting and right. things like that. So no parenting forever. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's helpful to think about your marriage, not as just like this gap between two persons, right? That is a line. It's sort of a weak. It could be fractured and disappear. 
but like as a separate entity that your I do's have given birth to, yeah. it is your marriage. It's out there and it, it you know, it can't be disappeared basically. Yeah. So and I think that helped us too in our early marriage, like recognizing like we didn't create this thing, right? It now has this existence and it would help us to take off the table during our disputes a sense of, of uh, you know, if this gets any worse, I'm out of here, right? I mean, it's kind of like it, it holds a gun to each other's heads. Like, okay, if you do this or if this gets any worse, the marriage is gone, right? Well, I don't think we have the, the, the right <laughs> to throw it away. So I think it helps to think of uh, of an entity as as enduring, and if you're committed to it and she's committed to it, then anything that gets thrown at you or that you produce yourself that's toxic to the marriage can be dealt with. You know, you can improve this thing. So there's there's never a situation when two people who want to improve it can't do it. They can. I love that. I love ending on such a hopeful note. That is so wonderful. And I could keep talking with you for a long, long time, but we have reached the end of our, our time together. So thank you, Mark, so much. It was so interesting to hear about your research. You've got your easy to find um, at your website, and you can always access Mark through essaymarriage.org. Thank you again, Mark. Great to have you. You're welcome, Amy. Thanks. Mm -hmm.